Yesterday evening, the directors of national intelligence and the FBI updated the public on foreign efforts to influence our election and our government's work to prevent them. They announced that Iran and Russia exploited voter information to send misleading emails. This is just another reminder that multiple different adversaries with multiple different objectives want to fuel divisions among Americans and create chaos. Iran, China, Russia, and other adversaries may have different goals, but they all share the same primary objective of undermining America's confidence in our democracy. And they're thrilled when their disinformation causes us, us, to point fingers at each other rather, rather than at them. The good news is that we've spent the last four years gearing up for this. Unlike the Obama-Biden administration, on whose watch even Democrats admit <clears throat> we were caught flat-footed, the Trump administration has worked overtime with Congress and other actors to get us ready. The White House has imposed harsh new sanctions on Russians who interfered in 2016. The Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, and the intelligence community have led efforts to strengthen and coordinate our defenses. <clears throat> Here in the Senate, <clears throat> the Intelligence Committee spent years studying what went wrong in 2016 <clears throat> and published a 1,300-plus page report with recommendations. In the last two years alone, we passed more than $800 million to fund and support secure elections. The Iranian and Russian operations described last night are being combated by the federal government in close coordination with state and local officials and the private sector. Details are being shared with Congress and the public as appropriate. Madam President, this is precisely how the process should work. We're miles, literally miles ahead of where we were. Even the Washington Democrats who spent years talking up the threats to our election infrastructure are now admitting that we've made huge strides. Just a few days ago, the Junior Senator for Connecticut admitted, quote, we're going to have a free and fair election because we've spent significant money from the federal government and through states to beef up protections of our voter list and our voting systems, end quote. Now, it's a separate question whether Democrats' ability to express basic patriotic confidence in our institutions should be so contingent on whether their preferred candidate seems to be up in the polls. But regardless, that's the truth. I'll close with one point that I keep making. The work of protecting our democracy is not just the job of experts in government buildings. This is also a duty that falls upon every one of us, every single citizen. At this point, it is a patriotic duty for Americans to be educated consumers of information. Citizens who need information about voting should look to their local official sources. And all of us on all sides should take a deep breath and realize that division, disinformation, and chaos are exactly, exactly what our adversaries want. We're all in this together. All of us Americans are in this together. Now, on a different matter, this morning the Judiciary Committee reported the nomination of Judge Amy Coney Barrett to the floor. Their recommendation that she would be confirmed was actually unanimous. As one CNN journalist stated last week, quote, let's be honest, in another political age, Judge Amy Coney Barrett would be getting 70 votes or more in the U.S. Senate because of her qualifications, end quote. It is supremely ironic that our Democratic colleagues delivered through a temper tantrum what they should have delivered through a fair appraisal, a unanimous endorsement. They, of course, were not there. All last week, the legal brilliance and judicial temperament that our nation deserves in a Supreme Court justice were on full display. We saw why legal peers, fellow scholars, nonpartisan evaluators, students, and clerks from across the political spectrum have praised this nominee in the very highest terms. In just a few days, 
she'll receive a vote on this floor. And I anticipate we'll have a new Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. That is exactly what the American people want to happen. Clear majorities of Americans want Judge Barrett confirmed. Of our fellow citizens who formed an opinion, roughly two out of three want confirmation. The Democratic leaders' histrionics are proving just as unpersuasive outside the chamber as they've proven inside it. His anger and false statements have failed to persuade the Senate and they have failed to persuade the American people. Day after day, our colleague from New York performs the same angry speech with the same falsehoods and force a vote on some pointless, impermissible motion. Democratic leader is just lashing out in random ways. A few weeks ago, he torpedoed a bipartisan counterintelligence briefing for no reason. This week, he blocked a pandemic rescue package and tried repeatedly to adjourn the Senate for multiple weeks. Today, today, I understand that he stood outside the Senate to shout that Democrats would be boycotting the committee vote. And the committee vote actually had already ended. Look, I understand that some outside pressure groups have been badgering the Democratic leader to act more angry. I'm just sorry for the Senate that he obeys them. I'm sorry our colleague felt the need to publicly brag that he had scolded the senior senator from California for being too civil. Scolding somebody for being too civil? One of our colleagues? Not a good idea to be civil? Really, I'm sorry that he feels the need to constantly say things that are false. The American people know that we disagree. They do not expect come by yai, but they deserve an adult discussion. So let's review some facts. First, the timeline. The Democratic leader claims that this process has been rushed are simply false. 16 days passed between President Trump's announcement and the start of the hearings. In the last 60 years alone, eight Supreme Court confirmations moved faster. Only eight moved faster in the last 60 years. Then one week elapsed between the end of Judge Barrett's hearings and today's committee vote. Half of all the confirmations since 1916 have moved faster than that. Half of all the confirmations since 1916 have moved faster than that. Justice John Paul Stevens was confirmed in 19 days from start to finish. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, it took just over a month. Chief Justice John Marshall was confirmed in one week after John Adams had already lost re-election. John Adams appointed Chief Justice John Marshall after he'd already lost the election. President Lincoln got someone confirmed in one day. Obviously, it's completely false to say that this has been anywhere close to the fastest process ever. It's just disinformation. Here's another nonsense claim that Judge Barrett is somehow the most partisan or politicized nominee ever? Really? Andrew Jackson nominated a political operative to the court at the end of his presidency. Lincoln put his own campaign manager on the court. Eisenhower nominated Earl Warren after Warren had stopped competing with him in the 1952 election and campaigned for him. But this professor from Indiana, who got multiple Democratic votes for confirmation to her current job just three years ago, is going to be the most political confirmation ever? 
In the previous century, they put their campaign chairman on the Supreme Court. That's pretty political. Eisenhower put the governor of California who ran against him for the nomination on the court. That's pretty political. I'll give you an example, the, the great John Marshall Harlan from Kentucky had a partner who was a cabinet member in the Grant administration, a guy named Benjamin Bristow. And um, Bristow was sort of thought of as Mr. Clean in the Grant administration, which had a lot of scandal problems. So the GOP convention in 1876 was going to be in Cincinnati. And so in those days, of course, if you wanted to be president, you couldn't admit it. It's a, you sort of had to act like you were being drafted. So John Marshall Harlan, the largely unknown partner of the better known Benjamin Bristow, went to Cincinnati to the GOP convention to get his law partner, Mr. Clean, the nomination. The perfect choice after eight years of scandal in the Grant administration. Well, it became clear after a few rounds of voting that he wasn't going to be able to pull it off for his partner, Benjamin Bristow. So Harlan, through Bristow's votes, to the governor of Ohio, Rutherford B. Hayes. And amazingly enough, right after President Hayes was sworn in in March of 1877, it was John Marshall Harlan, not Benjamin Bristow, who ended up on the Supreme Court. He served for 30 years with great distinction and was the sole dissenter in Plessy versus Ferguson, the one member of the Supreme Court in 1896 that got it right with regard to desegregation and public accommodations. Now, that actually became the majority opinion 58 years later in Brown versus Board of Education. Talk about a political appointment. That was a political appointment. Amy Coney Barrett is not the most political appointment ever to the Supreme Court by any objective standard. So these are not really arguments. They're just kind of angry noises. The Democratic leader said, quote, Abraham Lincoln when he had the opportunity to fill a Supreme Court seat, said it would be unfair to do so close to an election. That's not true. It never happened. President Lincoln never said that, nor did he do that. The Washington Post already debunked this disinformation when another Democratic senator tried to spread it. Now the Democratic leader is claiming Chairman Graham did something unprecedented in committee this morning. That would be news to Senator Leahy, who had a Democratic majority vote multiple judges to the floor in 2014 when there were not two Republicans present. Chairman of both parties have done the same thing multiple times. And the Democratic leader continues to misstate what Republicans said in 2016. Let me quote verbatim from my very first floor speech after Justice Scalia passed away. Here's what I said. The Senate has not filled a vacancy arising in an election year when there was divided government since 1888. That's what we had then, divided government, Republican Senate, Democratic president. Now, my friend, the Democratic leader, may be emotionally invested in this idea that I said something else. But that's, in fact, what I said. Historical precedent supported no confirmation in 2016, and it supports confirming Judge Barrett now. So look, Madam President, I mean, everybody knows what's going on here. We know why the Democratic leader feels this need to keep saying things that aren't true. Our colleague is trying to invent a justification 
to declare war on judicial independence and pack the Supreme Court if Democrats should win power. That's what this is all about. Back in March, he walked across the street, threatened justices by name if they ruled against his wishes. And now, even though this court ended up de delighting the political left with several decisions this very year, he still wants an excuse to pack the court. The American people know what a terrible idea this is. Polls show majority support for confirming Judge Barrett and overwhelming, overwhelming opposition to court packing. The American people are glad that Franklin Roosevelt didn't get to blow up our independent judiciary in 1937, and they strongly oppose Democrat threats now. Democratic leader may support court packing. Former Vice President Biden may call it a live ball. But the American people know these threats are anathema to the rule of law. This Senate majority will not let falsehoods drown out facts. We will not reward hostage taking and will not be bullied out of doing what is right. We're going to follow history and precedent and do our job. Clerk will call the